Welcome back. What we're trying to do is take our logical operators and turn them into programs. After all, the whole point of logic is to take natural language and make it predictable by removing some of those crazier grammars and simplifying the logic down to specific operations that have predictable introductions for how to use the symbols and eliminations for how to get rid of them. That's almost a program, but it still has the missing piece, which is actual data. To make a claim that something is true or false is too little information. We'd actually like to move around things like files and strings and pieces of data from larger projects. For that, we move to types using something known now as the Curry-Howard isomorphism. It's actually a family of many different types of isomorphisms, meaning translations between types of information. What we've done so far is we've looked at replacing AND with ordered pairs. For example, a string and an integer. And we replaced implications with functions. A function takes an input and creates an output. With those two translations, we can do quite a bit of programming and a little bit of logic as well. So it makes sense that if we have some claims, some proofs in logic, we should be able to create corresponding programs. So let's look back at some of the things that we've done. We proved this statement in sequent calculus. We showed that if A implies B implies C, that's the same as having that A and B implies C. As a quick bit of notation, when we draw the entailment two ways, we often just do two parallel lines to indicate the entailment goes up as well as down. These are equivalent sentences. So if we just follow our correspondence from our previous videos, we should be able to write down some data types to go with this. I'll keep the names of the types the same as the premise. So what we have here is a data type that's a function on input A. Its output is also functions, but now functions that start with B and end in C. That's a little bit hard to get your head around when you haven't programmed for very long. So it's often the case that you want to translate this into something that's easier to understand. For example, how about a program that just takes in two inputs, one from A and one from B, and outputs one from C. So our effort will be rewarded because it's a simpler program to think about a function that takes in two inputs than it is to think of a function that takes in one input and gives back another function. We are missing something though. Because this is about a data type, it should have some data. And our data is preceded by a colon or preceded by a colon to remind us that it has that type. So now at the top, I have a function f, which has type a maps to b to c. And the bottom, I have some new function, which I've called left of f. It might be useful to pause for a second and write this in some language that looks similar to how you might program this. Our premise would translate into a function in some syntax as def of f of a maps to something that outputs b to c. We don't know what the program actually is. This is the entire point of data types. We're encapsulating the logic so we can focus at the high level vision. We're looking for how the data moved. We don't actually care what the data is or what's done to it. This also affords you a lot of uses. You might want to keep your algorithm private, or you might want to make sure people don't misuse it. By giving it just the top signature, this data type, we prevent misuse of our data and we can focus on the right logic. What would be the corresponding definition of the function on the conclusion? We now see that it's very similar, only now we take a pair of inputs instead of giving back a function. We give back a single number c, but as a consequence, we must give it a pair. This is the function we want to have, so it's our responsibility to give it a program. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to use it. The key thing is, all we know at the start is this input function, and we can only use properties that are true of any function that looks like this, which means we can only use the elimination rule for functions and nothing else. So how do we use the elimination rule for this top function to get to an introduction rule for the bottom function? That's the entire exercise. The answer might come to you by factoring what's going on. There are multiple operations. If we factor them into a tree, we might see the raw ingredients and have a suggestion about what to do. Now be a little bit cautious. In both the implication and the AND, we only had two things that went together to form our operations. But when we created functions, because of the addition of data, we had to have three things come together. We had to have the program, the variable we were going to replace, as well as a proof that it would replace properly. So let's write down the first factorization of our two functions, the premise and the conclusion, and see what we can match up. In the premise, we're given a function that maps from A to B to C. 
And to use such a function, we need to eliminate it with its elimination rule, which means to provide a term little a of type big A. Then when we apply f to it, we know the result will be the outcome, which is b to c b. And this is part of the way. However, we start to realize there's a bit more we could do. Because the result is itself a function, if we want to understand that output a little bit better, we should try to use the elimination of that function as well. Again, we don't know what program made f, and so we don't know the program that made f of a either. We're just simply going to use the elimination rules to learn about it. So I'll give it a b of type capital B in this elimination rule. I will now get f of a of b, b. The result will have type c. It's worth pausing the video if necessary to realize that this itself is a new function, which we might have called g. And therefore, this output here is g of b. It's just that we're using one function after another function that it looks a little strange. Nevertheless, we now see the architecture is quite similar to how when we factored this information, we saw there were two implications, one outside, one inside. We now have an elimination rule and a second elimination rule. This is the syncopation with the logic. It's on purpose. The entire curry howard isomorphism is simply taking the logic and repeating it as steps in the program. But what do we need to create the left f to entail a function, any function whatsoever? You need the program. That's the guts that go inside the def part. You need to tell us the variable that you're putting in. And you need to convince me that whenever you plug in the right kind of data for the variable into the program, it'll come out with the right kind of output. In our situation, the right input are pairs A, comma B, and the right outputs are Cs. Now, if we stand back, we can look to see if we have such information. Over here, we see we have a function which somehow seems to involve a pair of A, comma Bs. When it has the entire pair of A, comma Bs, it does, in fact, produce something of type C. It'd be wonderful if we got those together. And of course, we have that information. If I start with a u, which is my variable, and I plug in an a comma b, then to get the first value, I need to call the command get a, get the part that's in the left. So my input u will be fed to the function f, and for the a value, I call u dot get a. And for the b value, I call u dot get b. Having satisfied this, I now have an f of a and an f of and a b which has type C. So I've concluded that on an input A comma B, my program will substitute correctly and give me a value C. I've satisfied this. I now have a program and a variable. And so together, I have now introduced a program left of F. And it doesn't have to stay as a factor tree. We can rewrite this with the syntax of standard programs and see the, ste the steps one at a time. So there we have it. In the syntax of my pseudocode, I now have a completely new function called left sub f. Left sub f is replacing the role of this in my programming language. It takes as input an a cross b. Now, most programming languages would prefer something like calling it pair of a b, or I've used the parentheses notation here. This is just to demonstrate that when we translate to programs, we often have to do with some artificially renamed symbols for the same data types. The input is now a single ordered pair, u. But that ordered pair, by being an ordered pair, has a part A and a part B. I can get the part A by calling u.getA, and I can get the part B by calling u.getB. That's specific to the syntax of this pseudocode, but the key thing is, in any program that replaces and with Cartesian products, we're going to have two elimination rules that behave like these two, by whatever syntax. We now plug those into our function f, which we do have. The first part turns A into a function from B to C. The second part takes that b and turns it into a value c. We've created exactly the function we want. This is one demonstration of many. Take any program, write enough specifics about it that you can write it out as sequence where you can see the translation of all these microcosms of little logical steps, and you are writing down a program. And in fact, it goes both ways. Imagine you write a really clever program, it turns out each one of those steps can be reflected in a logical progression. You're actually writing a proof in mathematics. This two-way function is actually the heart of why programming is such a reliable way to learn mathematics and why mathematics is such a great journey to becoming a better programmer. They're really the very same topic. It takes a while to get comfortable with that fact, and certainly with examples that are this small, you might feel that the payoff is far away away. 
I promise you, the more you rest with these ideas, the more you'll go looking for new places for good programs. Mathematics has been written for 3,000 years. It's a colossal head start on many other topics. If you reason with other people in natural sciences, you're going to reason with proofs. You're already writing a program together. Even if you're just talking to a biologist about cell division, you're talking about a little program. Keep this in mind and you'll see programs everywhere. And once in a while, one of the programs you write might inspire a brand new process in some science. It's a two-way street, exploit it both ways. Until next time. That's how you take care of your chalkboard.